is Akram, that's uh, Akram is First Nation. My Canadian name is Neil Phillips. I'm from Port Douglas. I went to St. Mary's Residential School for 12 years. Well, I knew my own language, that's the only language I knew when I was a child. And when I got to St. Mary's, uh, I had to learn English quick. Um, because that was the language of the, the supervisors and, and the rest of the students had their own different languages anyway, so. Sometimes students today are disrespectful in their, to their teachers in class and are sent down to the office for detention. What happened when students were disrespectful in your school? In St. Mary's, when I was growing up, you were punished for absolutely anything. They would tug at your ear, tug at your sideburns, wrap you on top of the head and if you grumbled, got angry, showed disrespect as, as they would say, then, then it was their excuse to strap you. you know, I mean, they seemed to enjoy breaking you down. I mean, we didn't go by names, we went by numbers. My first, my junior years, I was number 48. My intermediate years, I was number 78. In my senior years, I was 113. So I didn't go to school early because I was halfway through my year. So you had to be six, and I wasn't six yet. So, and back then, in my time, we went right through to the grade 12. But in my dad's time, it's when you turned 16, you were shished out the door. Back then, the half a day was going to school, the other half a day was working the farm or the coal bin. My dad worked the coal bin. And like I said, the important thing to them was running the school, the power system, everything, not the education. So, but it changed to education as they got more modern, you know, so. And media became more usable on our behalf. And I wish we had internet back then, you know. I mean, a lot of these things probably could have been not prevented, but at least minimized, you know. What was life like when you left school? Did you feel that you were prepared for life after residential school? I thought I would be, um, because I thought, oh great, freedom, that looking over my shoulder didn't happen to hap happen anymore. You know, every little noise, their footsteps, their keys rattling. You know. So I figured I went straight back into school, into college, uh, because I go into the books, I was a good student. Um, but. Once I got to college, the difference between discipline and, and freedom to act on your own education was hard. Uh, in college, you were allowed to sleep in class, come late in class, leave early in class, smoke in class, eat in class. You couldn't do this in St. Mary's or, or the high school, but all that um, freedoms I took advantage of and because, because I didn't even have to show up into school if I didn't want to, I didn't because I was out partying, getting myself into trouble, running into the wrong crowd just for the sake of uh, getting angry and hitting someone because um, that's what happened to you daily when I was in high school. Uh, we got called down, spit on, pushed around, knocked down, fighting behind the gym, you know, everything. Um, so instead of being the victim, I became the one that chased. I dove into the drug world, I dove into the bottle, I lived in the bottle. Um, I, 
became non-caring. The only time I seemed to show any remorse or caring is if I went back home to the res. res. But other than that, when we came to town, which any town, I was free to, to um, be the worst person that you hated. You know what I mean? I became what I didn't like. You know? Only because if I didn't do it first, it would happen to me. It was in the back of my mind all the time. So I lost track of being educated and thought that I knew all the answers to the world. I went logging, built my muscles up. I got meaner, I got drunker, and the drug world became an escape. Uh, I was like everybody else. I can handle it. It won't control me, but it did. Eventually it did. I took my, my mom to get me off of the hard drugs because she showed me a picture of me in my logging days when I was a huge man and showed me a picture of, or well, made me look in the mirror of me right now. I was skinny, gray, and I accepted that I wasn't in control. Asked my parents to look after me. I was going cold turkey, climbed between them in their bed. Stayed there for three days, told my dad, no ambulance, cops, or anything, or you'll, I will disappear. Three days later, I shook my head to my dad, called the ambulance. They had to lift me up on my sheet. I was so skinny. And I dropped the heavy drugs. Still lived in the bottle once I got out. Still angry. But running into my wife, Phyllis, she was a patient lady. I climbed out of the bottle for her. She didn't ask me, force me. But it was the way she made me see the world and the way she made me understand that the anger in me could be put to good use by expressing to others of what a life not to be. I mean, I hurt myself more than I hurt anybody else. Um, uh, I, I now, with my wife Phyllis, we, we started to um, get involved. Even though we retired, we got more involved. Um, and today, um, I'm still very involved. And and that understanding what the residential system did, not just to me, but to my parents, my grandparents. It took the parenting out of us. And when we went home to raise our kids, we didn't have that parenting to teach. We didn't have those elders who trained us as children, wasn't there because they were living in the bottle. So we had to retrain ourselves from the very few that got away from the system and are now bringing, us, bringing our circle back into whole and making our younger children understand that the red way is not just the only right way, but it is a way for a people to look inside themselves as a direction to take. Do you have any advice for young Aboriginal students today? The best way to teach anyone is by example. Your lifestyle is how other people learn off of you. I taught a lot of young people how to drink, and how to get stoned. That wasn't right. At the time, it was funny. It made me the big man at the time. 
but today I understand how wrong it was. And, and, and I try to explain to others that um, you're on the same path that I was on. I'm not trying to say that uh, you, one day you'll change your mind. Uh, what I'm saying is you should start thinking about it today, you know, for yourself. I mean, be proud of yourself. Um, if, 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 if you can walk around with your head up and smile, you've got all the power in the world. People want to follow you. I mean, this guy's got a happy life. He's content. That's what I want to live. Instead of in this hidden, angry world that I pretend that isn't there. We got to work on sharing and, and trusting and believing in, in each other that uh, we can bring the best out of each other as well as work on what we see as our weaknesses. Weakness isn't wrong. Weakness is something that you just have to strengthen you know, and work on. You know what I mean? Yeah. At least if it's a weakness, it means the good thoughts and feelings are still there. You just have to work on them. So the system taught us down the long road that maybe some people had good intentions, but the system itself was flawed. Good day, my name is Johnny Williams. My ancestral name is Kwachen, which translates to leader or helper of the people. The song that I've been asked to share today is a little bit of an older song. A song we use, I guess, for a little more of, of sad occasions. And it's a very unique song because we can do it both in English and in Halkamela. I used to 